Welcome to the center of the universe and the home of the 18-time Grey Cup champion Toronto Argonauts. This is the X's and Argos podcast with Ben Grant and JB. Welcome to the X's and Argos post-game reaction podcast brought to you by something in the water brewing. The Toronto Argonauts somehow, in some way, win 20 to 19. And I say somehow, some way, only because it felt like everything was going wrong for the Argos. In truth, they should have won this one by many, many points. And yet, there they were at the end, kicking a field goal for the win. Ends up being a rouge, but the Argos will take it. 2019, the final score. Argos over the Saskatchewan Rough Riders in the CNE game here at BMO Field. Ben Grant joined as always by JB. And before we get into the recap and what went on tonight, I want to tell you about something in the water brewing. Our title sponsor down in Liberty Village who have a wide selection of great beer to choose from. Next time you're going to Argos practice or next time you're coming to watch the Argos play a home game, make sure you get down to BMO Field. They are steps from both stadiums. They've got beer for fans of the Double Blue Longboat Pale Ale and a lot of other great beer to choose from. So check out something in the water brewing next time you're in Liberty Village. JB, let's get to it. That was the weirdest game. It came down to the final play, but the Argos really should have won this one by a couple of touchdowns. Yeah, I, if you're in Saskatchewan, I don't, I don't think you feel like you were robbed. Uh, Toronto was the better team. Uh, it was just Toronto's strange, uh, confounding inability to convert short yardage uh that kept it close um yeah you know i think uh, uh, you know toronto toronto deserved to win um but <laughs> it definitely looked like for a long time they weren't going to and uh that this was going to be a rage fueled uh, podcast but now it is no longer rage fueled it's only rage tinged so what did you make of Jack Kelly's performance? So you look at him going 24 of 39, 322 yards, no touchdowns, one interception. How did he play in your eyes? Yeah, I thought he played really well. Um, you know, I thought he, 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 you know, he, he, he looked, he looked a lot like last year. I, I thought he got, he got better as the game went on. He made some absolutely, you know, like there were a couple of times, you know, where he rolled out um, and he, he threw, uh, a bomb to Coxey, or he rolled out. Uh, unfortunately, you know there was a couple of ones that didn't work out, but there were a couple of throws. His throw to Anger at the end uh, to convert that. Those are big time professional arm throws. You know that those are star throws. So I thought, I thought he made enough star throws tonight to to feel like he did a good job. Uh, and you know a lot of it was rust. You know just working with the ones. A couple of touch passes to Devaris, you know, were a little off because they haven't been working together a ton. Um, and, you know, there are still short yardage issues with him in at quarterback. But uh, I thought his arm looked great, and I thought his decision-making was really good. I mean, just just the one interception was, was really the only poor decision he made, uh, I thought, the whole game. Yeah, and that's that's it. Like the interception, and I don't know how much of that was him getting hit as he threw as well. It oh looked like God, he, he wanted to give hard. Demonte Coxie a, a one like a 50-50 ball, but he was rocked right as he threw that ball and it was way short. You don't see Kelly throw short a lot like that. So I don't know about the decision to go there, but he when any, anytime he sees Coxie one on one, he's gonna take that. But yeah, man, he got hit so hard. Yeah, and, you know, I don't think you make that throw. Like, that throw was not the throw there. There's two minutes left. You're driving. At at, at worst, you want the tying field goal. There, there's no need to throw that hero ball. But I thought that was the only mistake. Honestly, I thought that was the only mistake he made. I thought he thought he had a really nice touch on those uh, curl screens that they broke out. And, um, you know, I'd like to see a little more uh, kind of, like, deep posts from him but uh i think that's coming those quick screens out wide there's such a difference when you can get the ball there fast and you see like it's they were running those with dukes and arbuckle but it's different with kelly because he gets the ball there that much quicker and it's funny you don't think of like you know these are professional quarterbacks dukes arbuckle like these guys they've got great arms but not like kelly's arm and getting it to those receivers that quickly it allows for them to turn those into first downs that's how they're supposed to run and it seemed like every time they ran one of those, it went for a first down. It was one to Angara, one to Coxie. It was their third one as well. But those those help 
you offensively because it forces the DBs that can't give you too much cushion if you're going to run those every so often. And so they've got to come up a little bit. And that's where the over the top stuff can can really burn you. Yeah, that the ball to Makai Polk on the sideline, the ball to Demonte Coxey deep on the sideline as he was rolling out. Like those were the two, maybe the two best throws of the night. But there was another one too to Devaris Daniels, two actually, one Devaris caught, one that he couldn't quite bring in that I thought were sensational plays. I will say one more mistake, um, aside from the pick. The pass where Makai Polk just got lit up. That's a ball that you shouldn't throw. And so if you're if we're going to uh, praise Kelly for all of the passes that he hit and those those throws that just nobody else can make, we also have to be critical of that one. That's just a ball that a quarterback can't throw. You can't put your receiver in that kind of peril. And that's exactly what happened with Makai Polk. Luckily, he was able to shake it off and, and continue playing. But, man, he got rocked on that play. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know, uh, in fact, how he was able to continue playing. But... Uh... Yeah, that, I mean, that was a bad throw. And, you know, and to be honest, I mean, Kelly, Kelly's one kryptonite last year, I found, was his red zone play. That he, you know, that he, he he's not great rushing the ball on keepers, and he's not great throwing the ball when he's like five and in. Um, and so that's an area that, you know, I would assume they're going to continue to work on because, it was an issue last year, you know, despite everything he did incredibly well. I don't want to be negative. I thought I thought for a first game back, uh, he looked fantastic. You know, he made a lot of monster throws. And, you know, they don't win that game without him tonight. Oh, no, no. They, 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 there's like, That's the thing. And I, I said that with, with Nathan Rourke starting for BC as well. Like, he, Nathan Rourke didn't look good. But it's not like they were going and winning that with, with Dola Gala or Chase Bryce. Like, the that wasn't happening. You put your guy out there. You put your number one guy out there. And Chad Kelly showed that he is the number one guy. There's there's a clear difference. Now, it wasn't rust-free. He was off a little bit. Like, he and Devaris seemed to have trouble on a couple of routes where the timing just wasn't quite there. He threw behind Devaris once. He threw at Devaris' feet one time where it just didn't look like he quite got what uh, his receiver was going to do. They'll iron that stuff out. But, yeah, for the most part, I think he was great. Let's talk about that short yardage stuff, though. Okay, so, we talked about that now. So, well, what were you going to add in just before we? No, I'm just going to gonna say, really, he threw two touchdowns. Like he threw one where his guy was mugged, and the referees decided that that was okay. And then he threw the other one to Devaris, who bounced into the end zone. And to my mind, that's a touchdown. Like the, he was definitely not touched when he bounced into the end zone. Yeah, there. So I actually think there might have been four touchdowns there because you've got the one to Demonte Coxey where it was initially ruled a touchdown and then it was reviewed and it was waved off. And then Coach Dinwiddie challenged for pass interference and that was waved off as well. I know, um, right, which was ridiculous. I mean, it was... I like, know. He, he was... I mean, he was absolutely mugged. I don't... I don't understand... I mean, unless the command center now is just going to simply confirm all calls on the field so that nobody talks about them, that's not going to help. If that's the new plan. Well, he wasn't as mugged on that play as Polk was on what I'm going to call the third touchdown pass. The second one was a play out to Coxie on the other side of the field where TJ Sales like just tore him to the ground because he was beat. It was a double move. Coxie had a hard step to the inside, broke back out uh, to the corner and Sales was beat. And so he basically just tackled Coxie. Unfortunately for Toronto, instead of getting set up on the one, they just replayed the down because there was a holding penalty against Toronto on that play as well. So... That that offset it. But again, that's not Chad Kelly's fault. The third one, which I thought was the most egregious penalty that wasn't called, Makai Polk on the flea flicker. Kadeem Carey takes it up the belly, throws it back to Chad Kelly. Makai Polk is wide open. Now, what happened? Kelly looked like he took an extra second to find the laces. It just took him a split second too long. And by the time he threw it out there, he didn't want to he didn't want to overthrow his guy. His guy was so wide open. But it's just a split second late. And it allowed, I think it was, was it Williams that got back into the play there? Who yeah. clearly saw that Polk was open. He's going to catch a touchdown. He's like, well, I may as well uh, set them up at the one yard line. And just, yeah, knocked into Polk well before the ball got there. No flag. Coach Dinwiddie had already used his challenge. Nothing you can do about that. And the command center, and I think correctly, the command center shouldn't weigh in on plays like that. I like the way that the command center operated. In terms no, of they, exactly. they, didn't, they didn't buzz in for anything. I'm I, fine with that. Don't I don't want the there. 
but the other be, one I disagreed with. That should be called in the field, though. That uh, that but the referees were standing. There were two referees staring at it, and I'm like, like, what are we doing here? You you're just not going to call that, like. Anyways, now, 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 see, this is my rage tinge. But if you look at it, really, Kelly comes back, could easily have had two or three touchdowns and 300 yards. I mean, that's that's a spectacular return uh, to to ball. So, yeah, I think on that front, um, I think Argos fans have to be uh, have to be happy about that that performance. Let's talk about let's turn to the ground game and there were some issues. Um let's before we get into the short yardage, let's talk about Kadeem Carey. Saskatchewan is great at defending the run. I'm surprised at how well they bottled up Carey. He is one of the best backs in the league. He and Brady Oliveira basically are battling it out for top spot. Carey had eleven carries for thirty five yards. And he did contribute a little bit through the air, but we're just talking about the, the ground game right now. Uh, what did you see Saskatchewan doing that just didn't let Kadeem Carey get free? Yeah, I, I thought that their, you know, like their 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 secondary um, was was playing really well, very aggressively, and um, from uh, the defensive line, they're just as you can see from the short yardage. There just was no, like the, the 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 Argos just did not win on the line. There just were no gaps. Um, you know, like essentially, Kerry couldn't couldn't find uh, a gap. I I thought I was happy they went to him a little more. You know, I thought that that they should, and I always think they should probably use him more than they do. Uh, you know, I think I think they got away from him. He only, you know, he only had ten yards in the first half. Right. Um, so you know, I thought, you know, I thought that they should, um, you know, try and use him a little bit more. Um, but uh, yeah, like you know, they did a very good job of bottling him up. Like, you know, he's he's not a huge guy, and and the Saskatchewan D line is incredibly strong you know yeah. so that's not a great matchup but you know i thought uh you know i'm i mean kind of merging into the to the conversation about short yardage look they the argos do have a short yardage problem i don't think they're going to run into saskatchewan like what saskatchewan did tonight i don't think will happen with other teams um because they don't have their their line but you know clearly without Without Adam Aboye, um, you know they're missing a hammer in the backfield. Uh, they don't really, like I talked about last year, they don't really have a quarterback who excels at short yardage the way a lot of those teams in the West do. Uh, I I do think that is something that the Argos should look roster wise to try and fix. Yeah, I agree. I was thinking that as we were watching stuff after stuff, it was Chad Kelly, it was Cameron Dukes. And Dukes got Dukes did get through for one touchdown, but he failed on his other attempt. Uh, Kelly failed on two of his attempts. They ran to Kadeem Carey uh, twice uh, and wasn't able to get in either time. And they uh, threw a pass that no receiver looked for. Uh, that Again, from the one-yard line, they're throwing a pass out left. They had three receivers and Kadeem Carey all four of them were blocking on that play. Nobody looked for the ball. That one could have been picked. That hit Williams right in the chest, and he dropped it. But like the, every play they ran, with the one exception, the one time Dukes got in, the other what was it like six, seven snaps that Toronto ran yeah. did not work. And that's just not a recipe for success. I agree with you. I think if there's one thing missing on this team, it's a short yardage specialist quarterback, a guy like Tommy Stevens who is a big bruising quarterback who is going to fall forward and get you that first down nine times out of 10. No one can do it perfectly. We've seen Strebler miss. We've seen Tommy Stevens miss. No one's perfect at it, but you can't, you can't have what we saw here tonight where you're it's first to go from the one and you're nervous. Yeah. I mean, they were first and goal from the one three times and they didn't get in like in three different occasions I know. with <laughs> their snap count, you know, like, I mean, it just is really, really frustrating that either, you know, either you stick your head on the the butt of your center or or the guard, you know, that you feel can can get some gain. Um, 
yeah it it has to be fixed that that's that's the takeaway is is you know it was the same problem they had last year to be honest um and like tonight a lot of times it doesn't come up quite this drastically because you're not going to run into teams that can stuff you the way Saskatchewan can but uh yeah that was that was uh rage inducing you know because it's really I've had that happen like you know in in high school it's in, incredibly frustrating to constantly being uh unable to to bully your way into the end zone and then you know you, you can see on that one carry run you know he just he just isn't big and strong enough to to win that one-on-one tackle battle on the one and you need a back who can who can overrun a tackle on that one yard. Yeah, no, exactly that. And I don't know. I I think like I don't see other answers like on this. I, I just don't see answers in the roster on this team. And because I, I think like yes, you can give it to the running back. Yes, you can have a power situation out of the backfield. But I I really think in Canadian football, first and goal for the one. The way the rules are set up, it really should be a quarterback sneak. And Cameron Dukes, while he's a great running quarterback, he's not a he's not a, a quarterback sneak artist. It's obviously not going to be Nick Arbuckle. I think you need to go out and find a guy that can come in and just for that scenario. And you know, guys can make a living like that. Like again, look at look at Tommy Stevens, Dakota Prukop, uh, Chris Streveler. These guys are built for those situations. And you got Tommy Stevens leading the league in in touchdowns. And you know, he's he, he scores on pretty much every opportunity he gets down there. So. I think if if I'm the Argos front office, that might be the the one thing I try and go out and find because they, they they got away with it here. They they got the win, but you can't have this be an ongoing thing. And like you said, it goes back to last year too. This is not new. No, and and look, Tuesday is the mega shopping day, right? Like Tuesday is NFL cut down day, so there are going to be. Uh, hundreds. No, they're not all available and they're not all coming to Canada. But there are going to be a lot of players who are going to become available um, and could tilt the league. It, it tilted the league last year. Um, you know, so I think if if you have a shopping list that, you know, there's a bit, you know, Christmas is four days from now. Let's talk about uh, some of the receivers for the Argonauts before we shift to defense. Uh, I thought, you know, you look at how DeMonte Coxey has played this season. There are games where he's been invisible, where he hasn't touched the ball at all. Same thing with DeVaris Daniels. You know, he had, and it's the quarterback play that just hasn't been able to generate opportunities for them. Now, they didn't all convert tonight, but you look at DeVaris Daniels, 10 targets, only four catches, but you had probably two drops in there. One that I think is on Chad, one that's on DeVars, but it would have been a really tough catch. But the fact that you're able to get your playmakers targets, 10 targets for DeVars, eight targets for Coxie. Coxie ends up hauling in five of them for 112 yards. Oh, we thought he had a deep touchdown. It could have been could have been 150 yards and a touchdown, uh, but he couldn't quite hang on to that ball. Those guys, getting them involved, Makai Polk with six targets, three catches. Again, it could have been... Could have been 75 yards and a, and a touchdown and had that uh, flea flicker panned out. But those guys were suddenly open and available for Chad Kelly to get the football to. And then you add in Ungerer as well. Five catches on five targets. Ungerer using that same tactic that killed teams last year where he basically is on the wide side of the field. He's on the field side. He's He only goes five yards downfield and hooks. And nobody's near him. And Kelly can get him the ball in a heartbeat. Yeah, it, he turns around and gets the first down. It's a deep zone. It's an absolute deep zone killer. Yeah. Because there's nothing you can do. You can't you can't expand out as a linebacker. You know, essentially you can't play deep, you know, you can't play deep zone and cover that pass. Yeah, they the I thought the receivers were were great tonight. And they are going to get better as Chad gets more and more reps. Remember, that's on three days practice with more and more reps, more familiarity, especially with Polk, who hasn't got a chance to play with Kelly at all. I think Kelly loves seeing seeing what Polk can do out there. Uh, it almost turned into more, but when you add him to Unger and and uh, Coxey and, and Daniels, that's... Yeah, uh, you look at tonight. I mean, tonight should have been 35-19. Yeah. You know, um, and uh, sort of a, a shout-out to the league. Uh, it looks like a classic Argos you know, steal one at home, which it kind of was, but 
that that's not really what happened here. That I, the Argos did not steal this game. They, um, you know, I don't know what, what how to phrase it, but you know, they nearly gave away a game and at the last second uh, snatched it. You know, but the, it was this is not a stolen game. This this is a game they should have won by two touchdowns. Let's talk about I the mean, defensive. Sorry, go on. Yeah, no, I mean defensively. I mean, I you know I often. We'll we'll try and text you as you're on the air. Uh, I mean, Trevor Harris. Like I was watching the first quarter. I'm like, this guy is staring down his receivers, and it was frustrating because there were a couple of times where it looked like the Argo DBs kind of watched the guy. Sometimes that'll happen. Like you kind of let the guy catch it and then you tackle, as opposed to really being aggressive and trying to break up that pass. Uh, and then I thought as they switched away from that and realized like. Look, you guys are all over these receivers, and he is throwing where he looks. Um, I thought once they made that adjustment, um, the the picks just started flowing because he he's he spent the entire game staring down his receiver. I can't believe Trevor Harris went deep down the rail from his one yard line after that first time that Saskatchewan got the ball back. And, you know, Benji Franklin made a great play picking that one off. But I just, uh, the play call, like, where are you going with this? Um, but, yeah, those DBs, I think, played a great game. Let's talk about uh, that defensive backfield. So, Mark Milton, first of all, led the team in tackles with seven, had two special teams tackles great. as well. He was all he, over the place. My, yeah, he's my player of the game coming up. Or not my, my play of the game. Yeah, well, I think he was all over the field. And you look at the combination of he and Benji Franklin, there's so much speed on the boundary now. You've got Benji Franklin, who runs a 4-2-4-3, and you've got Mark Milton, who was on the Baylor track team, part of the 100-meter um, dash and, and the relay team. Uh, he's got speed coming out of his ears, too. So you put those two guys next to each other, that's a dangerous part of the field to throw to. And then on the other side, you look at how well Amos has been playing at fieldside halfback. He's dangerous. He, he's playing. He now is tied for the league lead in turnovers among DBs. Actually, I think among everybody. Uh, he's got four picks and two fumble recoveries. And I think that ties uh, Roland Milligan for Saskatchewan, who's got the six picks. And the guys just don't throw at him. You think about the number of times that Amos has been targeted, and it's not much at all. He keeps turning of those targets into picks. He got beat once early on. It was the first quarter. He got beat on a sideline route, and he was like, that is not happening again. He was only targeted, I think, once more, and he made a pick and, and made them pay. I thought I actually thought he got into the end zone. It was correctly called out at the one. He stepped out, but he, he did hit the pylon with the ball, but his, his foot was already out of bounds. But what a play from Deshaun Amos. The, the secondary was all over the place, and I really yeah, like they... how... Sorry, I, no, let me ahead. finish that up, but I like how... Yeah. Quincy Moje and Priester were on the field together quite a bit, both playing the yep. same linebacker spot, but they found a way to go, especially on second and long situations, to go in that sort of dime quarter look. And both guys were out there making it really difficult to pass. But the line played incredibly well, too. You know, they got a lot of pressure. Uh, the, the Argos hardly blitzed at all uh, tonight. And and the four guys were able to get home, especially at the end of the game. They They absolutely collapsed that pocket. Um, you know, and when you can, when you can get pressure from a four man rush, then, you know, that's going to be a dominant game. You know, they, they, they really improved as the game went on. I thought in the first quarter, I thought that, you know, Mike thought I wrote in my book, you know, lines not getting home and, and DBs are being too passive. And once they started playing Saskatchewan much more aggressively, um, and going looking for, for turnovers and the line. Uh, was able to get home and and uh, you know a lot of that stuff turned out to be more like power than than it was trying to outspeed them um you know they I thought the defense well they played incredible I mean they kept giving the ball back to the stupid offense who kept getting stopped with one yard I know the defenders were like how, how many times are we going to do this like you know of the defense you know absolutely in that first half kept the game close. It easily could have been out of reach uh, if the defense had not played so well because of this, you know, the squandered uh, scoring opportunities. Now, in fairness to the offense, they set the defense up with a really good field position, mm -hmm. surrendering the ball at the one yard line repeatedly. So Saskatchewan well, was working with a long field. Yeah. Yeah. But no, the that D played, the, the D played really well. 
You know what I think about too is this defense is dangerous. We know we talked about the DBs and how good they are. Don't forget, at some point, Winton McManus is coming back. At some point, Jaron Brinkman is coming back. These guys are going to add to the defense even more. And we know the offense has the potential to be really dangerous. The defense uh, is only going to get better from here. And they've really found some guys, too, and guys like like Milton and Franklin, who had a really rough start to the season. Remember, we talked about this the first couple of games. Franklin was lost out there and he was outstanding tonight. They, they played him in press. You just don't see that very often in the CFL. He was right up on the line, like a, a yard off, obviously, as you have to be in the CFL. But that's a dangerous place to play. But he's so good. He's got so much speed. It really threw off a lot of that quick passing game that Saskatchewan was looking to hit. They had held Keenan Schaefer Baker in check all night. They were all over. And Royce Metier did a really nice job coming downhill on Schaefer Baker. Franklin up pressing, getting in his face. Um, those Saskatchewan receivers, I think, will be happy to get out of here and not see this group again. Because even the guys that got further downfield, like MLS got turned upside down a couple of times. Keyshawn Johnson got turned upside down. They all took really tough hits. Um, you know, Bain, Sean Bain Jr., one catch, eight yards. Keenan Schaefer Baker, two catches, 11 yards. Like, those are their guys. I know some of the other guys had big games. Uh, MLS had eight catches, 66. And Myers, the three catches for 60. But if you're keeping Bain and Schaefer Baker from doing anything, and you do a, an okay job of keeping the run game in check defensively, yeah, you're in a good spot. Uh, special teams wise, uh, so before the game, this was this was what could have been a disaster. So before the game, during pregame warm up, um, John Haggerty, the Toronto punter, tweaked something and had to be pulled from the game, but they couldn't dress someone else in his place because he was the only global dressed for the game tonight. Teatro Hansen is on the injured list. And so Haggerty had to dress, even though he couldn't play. I initially, when I heard that report, I thought, well, at least they could leave him out there to hold for Herolahu so they don't mess with the mechanics of the snap hold kick. But he couldn't even do that, apparently. They had Nick Arbuckle go out there instead. You, as a former special teams coach, can attest to how difficult that would be for Nick Arbuckle. I know he's done it before, but he wasn't planning on doing it, certainly in this game. He was suddenly thrust out there. Nick, you're holding on these field goal kicks. And Haralahu was great. They didn't seem to miss a beat. They missed that last field goal at the end, but I think that was more intentional than anything else where Haralahu was just trying to kick it as hard as he possibly could. And also, of course, he had to be the punter today, and he did a pretty good job with that too. Yeah, he did. Uh, he played incredibly well. Uh, I was really concerned because, um, you know, he, well, I mean, certainly it would have been way worse without Kelly in terms of, you know, the field position game. Um and as Saskatchewan special teams played incredibly well, uh, you know, their punter was fantastic and yeah. probably uh, the game plan for how uh, the Argos will be punted to, you know, moving forward is teams are just going to, you know, aim it out at the 10 yard line. Um, but uh, yeah, he, he um, you know, for, for Arbuckle to come in and and be able to be, you know, I mean that just shows his veteran presence, right? I mean that that's why you have him on the team, you know. That's why you want to have a veteran quarterback. You want to have somebody who is not going to get freaked out by somebody being thrown in there, um, you know. And here are here are Hala, who is you know amazing. You yeah, know, he punted he the ball was, well. Not as well as Haggerty, but again, being thrown in there in this situation. Now, fortunately, he has punted he, before. Like in his stint in the in the uh, USFL last year, he only punted. So he's done that. He's a good punter. But yeah, he and as the game went on, his punts got better. Yeah, yeah. No, I I thought you know we got to tip the hat to both Arbuckle and and Haralahu. Um, do you think so? At the end, the last play of the game is the rouge for the win. I have to imagine that. I think they're trying to hit the field goal, but priority one, I'm sure Mickey Donovan sent him out there saying, kick it as hard as you possibly can. I don't care if it goes through, aim it towards the uprights. And if it misses, we at least still get the rouge. Because to me, it reminds me of when Toronto clinched the division in Montreal on Boris yeah. Beattie missing a field goal. Again, same idea. Just kick it as hard as you possibly can, Boris. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's not as easy as it might sound. I mean, obviously, A, you don't want to hit the upright. Um and and B obviously is like golf. I mean, kicking is golf essentially. Um, and so like you don't want to be like swing harder. Anybody who golfs out there knows that that is not 
uh, the solution to anything. Um, so yeah, it, it it's trickier than just you know give her a boot, you know, because if you do that, you, you know, you may not you may get a block, you may you know shank it. Um, yeah, it's it's harder than one might think to 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 kick a field goal hard enough for it to go out of bounds, but still be under control enough that it goes straight and you don't shank it. So, yeah, that that's, uh, you know, that's impressive for, for him. I thought he was, um, you know, I thought he was incredible all game. And, and then to, to be able to do that at the end uh, was, uh, was a very, uh, you know, a nice touch on the, on, on the player of the game to finish it off. Well, let's get to our player of the game recognition and our play of the game recognition. Uh, I'm going to give it to you to start off. Who did you feel was the player of the game? I think there's a lot of places you can go here. I'm guessing you're going to lean defense, but maybe I'm wrong. No, uh, for me, the player of the game is here in Lahu. I, I thought that he he stepped in um, and and punted well. You know, like he, you know, it, it, he, you know, he it wasn't amazing punting. But it was it was good and it got better as the game went on, um, and then uh, he kicked he kicked the field goals when given the opportunity uh, to to keep Toronto within spitting distance. You know, if he had missed a couple of those field goals, uh, they're not within a you know a field goal to try and tie the game at the end. Uh, you know, he kicked a forty nine yarder uh, to be right there. I thought that you know that he. He did a great job on kickoff. Um, you know, all three. I mean, he he put together a terrific game, uh, and then he kicked the winner. So for me, he absolutely was the player of the game. I mean, he 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 won the game for the Argos, which is what they've been doing all year is is having defense and special teams and offense kind of pick each other up, and they needed a big game from him, and he absolutely came through. For my player of the game, I am going to go with Benji Franklin. I thought he was fantastic tonight. And we've been we've been hard on Franklin early in the season, especially when there were it seemed like there was bust after bust where he lost guys in coverage. And we just wondered, you know, is he going to figure this out or not? And the coaching staff showed faith in him. Coach Fields working with him daily and, uh, you know, trying to bring him up to speed and this was by far, in my opinion, the best game we've seen Benji Franklin play. He was aggressive. His guys just weren't open all night. He made a great interception, uh, had an opportunity to uh, maybe not make another interception, but he he made another play on the ball later in the game. Uh, he, to me, looked like the best player on defense. Uh, Amos, maybe a close second. Royce Bechier right behind him there. A bunch of guys played well on D. But to me, Benji Franklin was the player of the game. I was so happy to see it for him. But it's not just the plays he made. It's that he was doing it from a really tough spot playing up close, a yard off the line of scrimmage in Canadian football with that much space out there on the field is really difficult to do. And yeah, I thought he was sensational all night, made some really nice tackles. So yeah, Benji Franklin, maybe an understated game on the on the stat sheet, doesn't necessarily stand out. I, I don't even know how many, he just ended up with one tackle in the night. You look at that one tackle, that doesn't necessarily stand out. But you've got the uh, one knockdown, one interception. Those are the numbers. And then just keeping his guys locked down all night. So he is my player of the game uh, for, for this one. And what's your play of the game? Well, mine goes to the defense. I thought that, um, I mean, of course, I could give it to Coach Mace for calling timeout, but I think my play of the game goes to Milton. I thought he made an incredible tackle to win on Saskatchewan's last field goal to, you know, to keep touchdown out of the conversation. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's just a great solid tackle. And, uh, you know, they, they had to kick a field goal. It keeps Toronto within a field goal. And they're able to uh, to salvage a win at the end of it. Um, so I thought he played terrific all game. You know, I thought, uh, you know, I thought Jonathan Jones played terrific. And, you know, in, in the absence of McManus, that's, those are big shoes to fill. I thought he played really well. And a lot of times when you play a team, how hard you hit the running back, sometimes will scare offensive coaches from using it in my experience. So it's like your running back is blown up by the linebacker. Then they say, well, I can't run. 
Uh, and there were a couple of blow-ups, you know, where they really laid stick on the running back. Um, and then Saskatchewan went away from the running back, who, who was it had some decent success against them. Um, so God love them for going all Trevor Harris uh, in the second half. But, uh, yeah, I think for me, Milton, uh, the tackle to to keep that play, make, make it go to third down, force Saskatchewan to kick another field goal. I thought that was, uh, you know, not not the prettiest play in the world, but it doesn't have to be pretty. You got the job done. You talked about Jonathan Jones having a good game, and he did. But you notice how what's funny is that both Jonathan Jones and Winter McManus are good at middle linebacker. They have such a different way of doing it. It feels to me like Winter McManus is so much more noticeable. Like Jones played well. He had a good game. But almost quietly, almost like the way an O-lineman has a good game, you don't really notice it. Whereas Winter McManus, when he has a good game, you leave thinking, wow, Wendon McManus had a really good game. What is it about Jones's game that doesn't necessarily flash the way McManus's does? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think, I don't think he flies to the ball as well as McManus does, which, you know, of course, I mean, that's why, you know, McManus is twitchier than Jones and a little more sideline to sideline where McManus will fly up and like, whoa, was that McManus that made that tackle? Right. Um, you know, kind of like Ray Lewis back in the day with Baltimore. So there's a little more of that. And, um, you know, and McManus, Jones hits well. Um but McManus can sometimes annihilate guys. So I think that's probably what draws your eyes uh, to it. So for my play of the game, I'm going to the third and 15 conversion because that was ball game. So Toronto down by three, still in their own end. And they go for it on third and 10. They get a false start penalty. It's now third and 15. I actually thought at that stage, I think it was like 150 left or something like that. I was like, is Toronto going to punt here? Because... Third and 15, they're starting a lot of plays for that. Credit to Coach Dinwiddie. He's like, no, we're well, like, we're going for this. I think it was on their own, it was on their own 50 or own 45 yard line. And they decided, yeah, they're going for this. Ungerer had a deep comeback route. Chad Kelly not only was able to get it there to the field side. We talked about that earlier in the show about how good those two are, but this is now 15 yards that we're talking about. Ungerer ran 20 comes back to 15, and he knew exactly where the sticks were because he caught the ball basically falling to the ground. And then he threw his body forward just to make sure he knew he was going to get touched in a second. And he's like, I don't want to risk this. I don't want this to be a measurement because he was like right at that 15 yard mark. He catches the ball on the ground, throws his body around to dive forward and make sure they had the first down. And that, of course, um, uh, you know, was the difference in the game. Because if Toronto gives the ball up there on their own 45, their own 50, Saskatchewan probably is able to add another field goal. And now you need a touchdown with very 20, 30 seconds left in the game. If you even get it back at all. So to me, and, that and, was the play of the game. And that's a, I know that that's a big boy throw yeah. that throw. Like, you know, that that's across the field. Um, that's just muscling that throw out there. That, that throw, like from a defensive point of view, that throw should not be able to be made. Uh, it was a great catch. It was a great, like, it almost wasn't made because it was such a hard throw, but it was, you know, great job by the receiver. Um, incredible knowledge of where he is on the field. So many receivers catch that ball a yard short, you know, much to my frustration, but not there. He absolutely knew where the first down marker was. Um, it's just great, smart football and, and a throw that, that not many quarterbacks in the league can make. It was the CNE night at BMO Field, and this one was a circus uh, on the field and off as the midway is going on behind me. JB, I can barely even hear you with the band playing below me, but yeah, what an environment, oh, oh. what a, what an atmosphere. If you think this is a circus? Wait, wait till next week. Yeah, where the circus is coming to town. Yeah, well, next the Argos take on the Hamilton Tiger Cats Labor Day. It's the Labor Day Classic. Um, that's the next one. Um, I'm down south this week. We'll still do our pregame walkthrough, but probably with a very different backdrop behind me. Uh, but look for that one uh, dropping about midweek as the Argos now get set to take on the Hamilton Tiger Cats. And they owe Hamilton one because Hamilton handed them a loss in Hamilton earlier this season in a game where they lost four guys to injury. They lost the game. They just ran out of time at the end. And you can bet that Toronto has payback on their mind. Well, that would just about do it for us on this uh, post-game reaction episode of the X's and Argos podcast. The final score from BMO Field, the Toronto Argonauts 20, the Saskatchewan Rough Riders 19. 
For JB, this is Ben Grant saying so long, and may all your pre-snap breeds be good ones. I'll see ya. Go Toronto Argos, go, go, go. Pull together, fight the foe.